back when I decided that uh, the psychoenergetic science approach um, was more beneficial for humanity than the orthodox science I was doing every day. And I was well regarded around the world for my orthodox science, and I needed to keep my day job to feed my family. But I could give up being department chair in my government committees and my professional committees to have the time to do this other area of activity in, in uh, my life. Um, and so I did that. Uh, people were shocked and surprised, etc. cetera, but um, to thine own self be true, as far as I could see. And, and from my perspective, this other was very, very important for humanity. So back in 1971, I made that decision. And ever since, I took the extra time and I divided it into three parts. Um, the first one was continued experiential development of self. The second part was continue to theorize how the universe might be constructed to allow this crazy-seeming kind of stuff to naturally coexist with orthodox science. And the third third was to design and do experiments to keep the theory honest. And I've been doing mm -hmm. that for the last, uh, what is it now, um, 40, 42 or 43 years. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, it's interesting what you're speaking in that um, real power true peace. The reason I developed this is and made the focus on embracing your mastery is to look at our potential and to begin moving into it in all the different ways that are possible, which also, of course, in alignment with what you said, in my understanding, is that we've got to wrap in that experiential wisdom with the intellectual knowledge. Without putting that really at the forefront, we're just going to keep spinning around. But I had a, get, um, a teacher, Robert Greene, he's an author, and he um, sp you know, spoke about the mastery. His whole book is on mastery. And he said he really wanted people to understand about you know, when you have that inkling of what you feel passionate toward, don't just walk away from it. You know, and what I hear you just did is you straddled the boat. Because like you said, you had to pay for your family, but you still opened the door to the other work that you were passionate about. And it's given you the extraordinary life that you've lived and the information that you've brought to light that no one else has in the way that you have. I, I think that's, that's true, and you have nailed it pretty well. I, I think this is one of the weaknesses of our present educational system. It's focused very much on mm, plowing over knowledge, um, having a channel of communication which is mainly knowledge-based, and there is almost no experiential development of self. I think that a properly balanced society would divide the time between experiential development of self and the infusion of knowledge uh, to build into the organism of the human being so that the human then can develop and plumb the deeper depths of reality. At the moment, our orthodox science, well, let me go back one step. I like to look at a picture of nature as it unfolds as we need to build a ladder of understanding which goes from sort of where we are at any point in time and the higher and higher levels of reality. And the orthodox science community which began this path called the Logos path or the science path um, about 500 years ago uh, in the days of Galileo and Kepler and Newton, uh, and Copernicus, of course, and that was the transition from a theocratic society to the beginning of scientific society. And the key reference frame for studying nature was distance and time. And we have done that for the last 400 years, basically, and we've been very successful 
But the dilemma is that science and thereby medicine have taken the attitude that it was a distance time only reference frame and that everything in nature, the expressions of nature, had to fit into that reference frame, which the work that I've been doing on the side for these last 42 or more years um, shows that that is not correct and that there are there's huge new physics to be sought out for adventure. Uh, right. Is this what you did with your um, with the white paper research and everything on the mythos and logos? Yes, basically that's that's it. Ultimately, we'll get to the place where mythos and logos will unite. I mean, mythos is looking inward for knowledge. Logos is looking outwards for knowledge. We are well. We have reached the bottommost rung of the ladder. We've completed the bottommost rung of the ladder, and we are now reaching for the second rung. It's taken us 400 years to fill in the bottommost rung of the ladder, which is the distance time reference frame, and the science and medicine that we know are really all tied to that. But the next rung of the ladder deals very much with what we would call the physics of the physical vacuum, where the domains of substance that function there all seem to go faster than light, and none of our instrumentation can perceive that information. Yes, so, I want to go deeper into that because this is some of the this is some of the most important um, information that I have um, gathered from you that I think it's really really important for people to understand. But before we go there, I, I just want to go back for a moment, and if you could give me just the simplest explanation of mythos and logos, what do those two words mean? Stand for? Well, mythos is generally thought of as the mystical path, um, but in fact, it's the inner path. Um, let's say examples of mythos would be the, those we would call Christs who were uh, teaching us. We start with Krishna. We could go to uh, Melchizedek. We could go to Moses. We could go to Lutzal. We could go to Confucius, we could go to Buddha, mm. we could go mm. to Jesus, we could go to Mohammed, we could go to Abdul Baha, and many others. These right. are elder brothers for us who have walked the path and shown us the way. That that basically is the mythos path. The logos path is the path of science. Um, the previous paradigm was an, uh, basically those the theocrats. They had a particular vision or version of nature, which they followed, and they thought they knew everything. Because they thought they knew everything, they wouldn't look through uh, Galileo's telescope, um, because if they had, they surely would then find what mistake they were making. And their prime mistake was, of course, that the sun and everything else revolved around the earth. That's kind of egocentric, um, but it was the paradigm of the time. And science very quickly showed uh, through that work of Galileo and Kepler and Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus, of course, didn't reveal it, or did, had made sure it wasn't revealed till after he was it passed on. Uh, because otherwise he would probably have been burned at the stake for being a heretic. Being a heretic. Yes. <laughs> oh, sure. interesting word, isn't it? It shows up again. It is an interesting word. Fortunately, in today's uh, world, we no longer burn heretics at the stake, but you do. they do take laboratory space. We do mock them. You. You, you, they do make it difficult for you to get research support. They won't yeah. publish certain papers that you would like right. to have published in major journals because they say, oh, our readership is not interested in this kind of material. That's right. So 
I mean, it is the way it is. So the yeah, and it is the consciousness. It is the consciousness of those who aren't ready. You know, and in that same way, um, sure. you know I, what I what it calls me to think about on a very you know simplistic level, in a sense, is like uh, Orville Orville and Wilbur Wright. Yeah, well, people said they, they were completely loony, you know, with their ideas, and yet they, you know, if they didn't, you know, push the envelope, we probably wouldn't be still flying around today. That's so right. it okay. seems that those who are the head of the curve, you know, and I would say that a lot of people listening here have experienced that in their own lives, that they have found that when they get insight and they want to share it with others, that depending on who you're sharing it with, you could get a blank stare (laughs) or, you know, that there's still, you know, not that wide of an opening and yet it is changing all the time.